All right, we're back. And we're here, Mike, Mr. Oliveira, do you have any more questions that you want to? I do, Mr. Chair, just one quick question. Okay. Uh, sir, in your presentation, you mentioned new ideas and new concepts. Could you give us a couple of examples of those? Well, I'm involved at the moment in other counties where there are innovative ideas being explored. Uh, you're, you you're speaking to the mic, sir. Bill. You may want to turn it on the button on the bottom there. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's okay. on. We good? You're good. <laughs> All right. Uh, <clears throat> so I am involved in other types of transit programs in other counties that include, I use the word creative approaches to service delivery. And that is a situation in particular where it isn't even a rural county like Calaveras. So there is more money available, there's more, there, there's more infrastructure available and so on. And even there, the nature of the needs is in that respect much like Calaveras where even non-traditional transit delivery options are really being seriously explored. I mean, substantial uh, volunteer programs that actually pick people up and help them in and out of doctor appointments and things like that where the people in the greatest need are getting very specialized services. And I, special programs for veterans, van services for veterans to provide access to VA facilities and that sort of thing are, are being tailor built in some of these other places because that is very specifically the need in that area. Uh, I haven't had a chance here to really seriously explore all of those kinds of needs yet. I think it's gonna be part of the early activity of the new JPA Transit Authority. But those are the kinds of things that I think where I have been involved in transit my whole career and have seen rural situations like this, it isn't always your standard traditional bus service that's the obvious answer. In, in your experience on the other transit districts, What's a fare box return rate? Hmm. I will say that I'm even involved in another county right now where fare box is a big issue. And it's a struggle making the minimum. And you know, the minimums can vary depending on your historical situation. But if say the minimum for a fixed route transit system is 20%, uh, very difficult for some jurisdictions to make that. And so they're looking at creative things. I mean, literally I do work right now in Stanislaus County there is serious consideration underway right now and probably will be a consultant study started in the next month or so to look at consolidating all of the systems there. There are four specifically to address the fare box issue. What's their fare box issue? Or well, rate? it varies among the four operators. So Can you give me an average? Modesto, Can you give me an average? The Modesto is several <clears throat> points above the minimum. Stanislaus County barely makes the minimum and two other jurisdictions are on basically probation right now. There are provisions in TDA to allow for that where you get a, a short-term exemption. And they've gone to very creative lengths to redefine their services to justify a temporary exemption so they can get around the application of the fare box limit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that, that's happening elsewhere in the state too. I mean, there are, there are situations around the state like this where fare box is just very difficult to so, make. Having said that, you would say, would it be a fair statement to say that Calaveras County is not the only county experiencing these problems in transit? Would that be a fair statement? Uh, it, certainly as it, respect, as it relates to Fairbox. That's okay. a very yeah. Let's talk very about Fairbox. Yes. Historically, I under, it's my understanding that the Fairbox rate uh, or the ability to make that has not been very successful in Calaveras County until recently. I understand we, uh, we're above our 10% uh, standard, and that's in the last recent 30 to 45 to maybe 60 days. Are you aware of that? I've heard this. Okay. COG staff may be more aware of it than I am. Uh, I, I guess I would be cautious about taking a 60-day period mm -hmm. as as rep as representing the year. You know, I mean, fare boxing would be based on a year total, and that's one of those things you can monitor as you go, but historically it has been a problem here. Yeah. Having said that, if we come back to the original question of our new ideas and concepts, 
And I understand you haven't had a chance to study Calaveras County closely. You're a very busy man. Um, is there anything off the top of the head that would kind of bolster my opinion of how to go, how, how to agree with this concept of having uh, transit go over to COG? Excite would, me. Tell me what, 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 what we haven't done mm -hmm. that's going to make this program at least take that first step in that journey. I think what has happened and now will hopefully change under a new JPA is transit here, in my experience, because I have done some other work in the county, even though it hasn't involved thorough analysis of the service deployment, so I'm familiar with Calaveras County. Uh, transit here is obviously part of a very big public works department, you know, with lots of responsibilities and lots of projects and and lots of different reasons to direct attention elsewhere. And whether that is the direct contributor or not, the fact is that transit has struggled here. As I mentioned at the very outset, uh, ridership has been declining, uh, costs have been increasing, cost per passenger, very high. Cost per hour, cost on the basis of almost any measure here, very high. And I think that with the new JPA, you have an opportunity here to sort of start with a fresh look, with a fresh perspective, a fresh group of staff to look at this and see about the possibility to introduce new service options, to re-examine the vendor contract, which I've referenced several times today. Uh, there are things that can be done right now, I think, that are available because you're at this pivotal point where the vendor contract is changing, you're facing pretty serious financial issues right now. Uh, this is a good time to take a fresh look at this. And, and I would also say, and reiterating a point I made earlier, that the idea of having a dedicated policy board specific to transit issues, I think is a step in that direction. And obviously in doing that, it will include the city. And certainly I have been involved in discussions about the fact that the city expects greater representation in transit decision making. This is that opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Garamendi, your light's on. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first off, I want to thank the uh, ad hoc committee for their work uh, on one hand. On the other hand, on the 29th, we said we were going to discuss various options. We're talking about a, a project that's ready to go. I'm not opposed to this project. Just would have been good to have more conversations, but we're here. My primary question is, um, I represent uh, District 2, which goes up through West Point. It is an area that will never make the fare box because mm -hmm. it's very expensive to get up there. <coughs> Some of these routes are very <coughs> important to our community. Uh, the big loop as well as uh, the West Point bus after school that allows kids to play sports at the high school and then get back home because uh, the school can't afford to run that evening bus. So we have a new partner on board with, uh, as uh, Angels was here earlier, a new partner on board. I want some assurance that we are gonna serve the most needed places, most needy places who need this transportation the most and make sure that we have proper outreach, that people know what the bus schedules are or ride options or whatever creative solution we come up to to meet the needs. I want some commitment that uh, we're not going to chase the mighty dollar and avoid and uh, not take care of the people in our community who need this route. So stuff like, I don't want a trolley in, in uh, Angel's Camp bumping the evening bus for kids from the high school. So what kind of insurances will we have, will I have for our community that services will continue? The, the principal assurance for that is gonna come from the new JPA board, which is gonna include representatives of this board and the city. and. I would say in part to your point about the service in your district, which I have heard some discussion of, that in my experience with rural or very small urban transit systems, the, the probably the single principal ridership group is students. You know, that, that becomes one of the big things. And even though under federal rules, you can't 
use federal funds to run a school transit system, jurisdictions like even here often structure their transit systems to meet the needs of the community often which relate to students. And that means not necessarily running a, a bus right up to the front door of the school, but providing service in the vicinity of the school, time for the schools, time for student activities and things like that, that actually provide a meaningful service to that critical population that doesn't drive. I would certainly, I, well, like I said, I'm not opposed to this idea. I just want to be very clear on the record that if there's a reduction of services that hurts the, my, the community that I represent, mm -hmm. I will fight this and mm -hmm. to the bone. Uh, if you come up with better ways to do things, that's one thing. But if there's any discussion about not providing service to that, to this part of the, of the county, uh, we will take it up in both COG and this JPA and in this board. I would expect that. And again, in fact, there have been specific discussions about your district and things that should happen there. Thank you. And if I can just note on that as well, um, right now the COG is, goes through and I'm at transit needs process every single year. Um, and with the new JPA, then that JPA would be directly accountable for implementing a lot of those findings and coordinating with, you know, nonprofit agencies that might better serve areas like that. So they'll have the ability to come up with some innovative solutions and actual real coordination agreements, partnerships with other agencies to serve hard to reach areas. Let's make sure we're all on the same page before any of that comes out or happens. Yeah, Thank and you. I, you know, I also want to extend um, and I can work with your county CAO in terms of reports and whatever this board might want to see out of the transit JPA on an annual or semi-annual basis, you know, so you're very full aware of what's happening with transit. Supervisor Mills. I think that we had talked about this before, but the, uh, the needs assessment survey that was done previously can be a good foundation for uh, being sure that we have uh, those private providers engaged and involved in the old overall success of whatever we're trying to do, uh, that it doesn't have to be strictly from the JPA and the transit side that we're going to provide, but to see this in a larger perspective uh, as we go forward. So if it's a case of, of uh, building the best system into West Point, it might not be a full-size bus. It might be a smaller vehicle. It might, there's different ways that this could morph. So, but if we don't talk to the other providers in the area and know what they're able to do, suddenly we're passing each other on the same road and both of us are losing money doing it. So that's the goal is just to be sure that we all have a voice in this conversation and, and can be able to use the dollars that are available to the best available way rather than just throw it out there and say, we're going to do it our way and that's it and, and not consider the rest of the uh, providers. And, and like I was saying, I'm not opposed to any new innovations or new ideas. Mm -hmm. Just we have certain minimums that we need to meet. We have to work with the community and make sure we communicate or spread out, it's difficult. Um, let's just make sure we work closely together. The only thing that really blows this whole thing up from my point of view is if there's not communication and I'm putting it upon your organization, the JPA, to communicate with us. I don't want to have to go hunt down and suddenly find out that a route's been cut in District 2. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Supervisor you know, one Oliveira. Quick, one quick uh, comment. In our new JPA, should this, uh, should this occur, is there any means, any formal means of reporting back to the county on how the transit system is doing, other than our two board members that sit, which I sit also as an alternate? Uh, is there a way to make a presentation to the board on a quarterly basis, if you will? Uh, would that Probably be somewhere Probably as often as you would want, actually. Uh, I, I think quarterly uh, might be good unless we have a <coughs> devastating occurrence. One of the things but, we'll be looking at in the transition period is the whole issue of the reporting mechanisms that are currently used, how data is gathered, how it's summarized, and how it's reported to folks like you and others who want to know on a continuing basis how things are going. And some of this could be as simple as a, a single page statistical report you might get. Uh, in addition to that, as Amber suggested, it could be a, a quarterly or semi-annual official report to the board. I, I mentioned in one of the slides the issue of transparency. That, that's really, I, I probably glossed over it quicker than I should have. But the fact is, 
the intent of this is to provide far more information than you might normally be used to and really timely information. And there's no reason it shouldn't happen. The, the contractor is under obligation in its contract to provide data back to now the county and soon the JPA uh, on a very timely basis. And there's no reason that isn't turned around and provided to you and to the city and anyone else who's interested. So I guess the simple point is it can be as often as you'd like. You certainly have the right to request and you will have representation obviously on that board. And I, I don't think there would be any difficulty giving routine reports okay. to the board. Thank you, sir. All right, I will open it up for public comment. Susan Morris, Angels Camp. I'm going to request that you not relinquish your authority to a separate board. And the reason I'm, at, I'm requesting that is because this board is unelected. The people elected each one of you as representatives. And when you turn over, your, you're turning over your authority to an unelected board. And I came from the Bay Area. And it's well known what's happened because we didn't realize that when we lived there that that happened often with various boards. The, the COG, I forget what they called it down there now since I've moved, but it, it ends up, you've relinquished your authority. So if you listen carefully, I think they tell you, and that's our concern, that's my concern. I don't want the board to relinquish their authority to any other group that is then going to be able to make regulations that you should be making. And I'm not sure, I know that you're concerned about money, and you're concerned about funding, you're concerned about these things, but I haven't heard anybody say that you're not relinquishing your authority to an unelected board. Now, you say, well, there's a couple of us that are gonna be on here appointed, but we didn't elect you to go on COG, we elected you to be Board of Supervisors to make county decisions. Does that make sense? And it's a big concern to me because we don't have any say in that other group anymore. When you turn that over and you relinquish that authority, the people are left out. And you'll say, well, not really, but yes, really. When you talk about ridership with transportation, the Bay Area, the nine Bay Area counties, they're kind of the poster child for all this stuff that's happening. And if you look at their buses, they got the longest buses, especially in the San Jose area you've ever seen, and guess what? They're empty too. The light ridership is low. Anyway, that's just something I'd like to add. Uh, Mr. Segala, end of the line, please. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Al, you could have went before me, I wouldn't have complained. <clears throat> Um, to follow up with what Ms. Morse was just saying, we're adding another layer of bureaucracy. More people doing more things, so there could be an added cost with that. Also, I'm curious, I, I, I didn't, not sure if I heard it earlier, is this going to be an additional cost coming out of public works moving forward, like 5% of their budget or anything like that, will it be transferred over? Will that be lost from here, going to the JPA for the buses, so on and so forth? Um, so, it, you know, hearing from a few of the supervisors earlier, they're worried about like the co the total cost, and if it goes over that, who who's held responsible for it? And you, you somewhat address that, but. The initial cost, will, will there be anything transferred out of anything that would be general fund moved over to that when, when, you, when you start this uh, maneuver over to the JPA and COG taking control of the route? Those are my questions. Ladies and gentlemen, board, thank you very much. Uh, Gregory Gustafson. I come off uh, four years on the school board, Mr. Garamendi, and one of your district issues is always a pawn for the school district to shuffle around was, you know, do, can we send a bus up there or cut a route or 
the time schedule and everything else, and it was almost abusive. Uh, of course, I voted to keep your schools open up there as well because that's a needed community. They don't, they don't need to be shuffled around or be pawned around. And it, as far as uh, buses, they said, well, gee, if we cut two routes, we can save the cost of two buses. Well, we were under contract to replace buses. And uh, they made the deadline, but they got government grants in order to do that. But the biggest concern was that late bus for the school. A lot of those kids couldn't make it up there. And for a while, I talked to the gal that was with the transit about seven years ago, I think I remodeled her break room or something like that. So at that time, they said, well, there's no way you can really join the two for the same reason. You can have a bus stop outside of a school or some other reason like that. But if you could do anything, those kids are hurt the most. Those kids don't have the parents running back and forth to Costco and so forth and so on. They need help getting back and forth to that uh, area. So if you can help them, that'd be great. Thank you. Good afternoon, Supervisors, Anna Sagala, Taxpayer Association, and a very good presentation, though I forgot most of it because we went to lunch. Um, one of the things that the taxpayer is concerned about is, bottom line, what's the cost going to be? And we would like to have the most advanced, innovative system going that provides inexpensive transportation, especially to the areas uh, out, of the, out of the way. And it could be that this may not be a creation of government. We are at the age of an inter internet revolution right now. They actually have people that drive other people around. They have a credit card they have, on the internet. The, uh, uh, I think one of them is Uber, and, and, the, uh, and it's, I think it's another one or two. And I'm just wondering if this driver, instead of driving a little car, was driving um, a nine-passenger van, maybe, uh, if the problems would start to be resolved without bureaucracy and without government. It's an, I know it's hard to picture that, but we're talking about uh, recreating a GPA, um, which is to be run by COG. We have experience with COG. We know how they manage things. And is that a good experience? Can we expect the same uh, pattern of management that we had before to continue? Uh, and also the question about loss of accountability and responsibility to the taxpayer. Uh, I don't think the taxpayer would have any hope of, uh, of influence on a, uh, with a COG or, uh, or government organization that's removed from the uh, Board of Supervisors. We even have very little with the Board of Supervisors. And so, um, I think that I don't, I don't know if there's if there's professional people that can look beyond the the government um, process of providing services. If they are, um, perhaps you need to get a report or a study to see what's out there uh, besides bureaucracy. Thank you. Bill Wilson, District 1. Following up on Al's uh, comment, I um, heard the other night on the news, uh, Sacramento started a program where you have an app and you can actually call for public transportation if you're uh, um, mobily challenged, I'll say. Uh, and they can actually come out and they pick you up. The gentleman that they had on TV said that the bus was there in less than 10 minutes. Uh, he couldn't even get an Uber driver out there in that time frame. He couldn't get paratransit out there. In fact, that's one of the reasons he used the app. He loaded the app and had a transportation before paratransit could come and get him. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things I think, um, does this service, service neighborhoods? What are neighborhoods in Calaveras County? West Point, Railroad Flat. Um, some people say Circle 20 is a neighborhood. We call it a ranch, but there's no bus service out that way. I don't think anything goes down Pool Station. How do we get somewhere? 
I mean, there's going to be a time when uh, I can't drive. What am I supposed to do? Get in my wheelchair and roll down the hill and hopefully get to some bus down to the station somewhere? I don't know. Um, we don't have transportation out there unless you have your own transportation or you have a neighbor that has transportation and you can get to them. But then you have to walk at least half a mile to get to that neighbor. I don't know. Rural transportation is always going to be a problem. Uh, kids getting home from high school. We have a bus, but it comes to the gate at the ranch. It doesn't come into the ranch and take kids up to their house. That's what's a neighborhood. Neighborhoods like over here behind the school or around the school. Anyway, um, gentlemen, you're going to do what you do. And that's probably not what anybody out in this audience wants. Thank you. George Fry, <clears throat> I'm a stout supporter of education. Had the opportunity to serve on the Balacito Union School District and be their chair for two years in a row. The only time we had a crowd of people at the school board meeting is when we talked about cutting aids on the playground or cutting routes. <clears throat> I was never in favor of cutting, cutting routes even though there's no mandate in the ed code to require buses for school districts. I also served on the countywide office of education. And um, I, think it's, um, I think it's really important that we um, have this uh, proposed JPA uh, Susan Moore said that um, there wasn't going to be any uh, supervisor, there wasn't going to be any people that were voted to serve on it. I don't believe that's true. There's going to be two city officials and two door board officials, and there's going to be three public officials. So it kind of looks like to me that the uh, four uh, voted officials will have the upper hand. Thank you. I'm sitting over listening, so I just wanted to come over and chime in real quick. Um, one of the main issues that we're running into is just an administrative issue. And it really comes down to year over year, we're having to come back before the Board of Supervisors and we're gonna have to ask for a loan. Today, right now, the transit fund is sitting with a half a million dollars negative cash. Um, they have received to date $71,000 of revenue. This is from July 1st. The kind of the issue, and, and someone had mentioned it earlier, I think the issue is it just doesn't get the level of oversight from an administrative perspective that it needs in order to do timely claiming, in order to do the reporting in a timely manner. And so we're looking for some way to help us with that. Because I think as we continue to go forward, we're potentially leaving money on the table. Um, we are gonna continue to have to come back to the Board of Supervisors for loans. Um, as of today, there's still over $15,000 that has not been paid back to the general fund from last fiscal year. This is just a continuous issue that we're experiencing every single year. I understand, you know, the other side of it is you want to try to protect your routes and, and kind of that operational component. But the other piece of it is part of operations is managing the finances. And it's just not getting that critical attention that it needs. And so as we continue to go down this road, I think that we are, um, we're risking the entire program because it's just not getting that type of administrative oversight that it needs. Um, if, if you want to continue to loan the transit fund money every year, that's your prerogative and you can certainly do that. Um, it's just, I don't think that's, that's, that was the intent of transit operations and I don't think that um, that's money worth spending. 
they're basically earning negative interest every month or every quarter because they're having to, to borrow money internally. And so how are they gonna continue to pay for that? So it, it's just, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're kind of at a crossroads here and we're trying to figure out how do we continue to run the system, get the oversight and the management that it needs um, and meet the needs of, of the public. But I just wanted to chime in from kind of a fiscal standpoint, we have a problem and we need to figure out some mechanism of making this work. Any questions for me? Yes, I do have a question. <laughs> I was waiting for the chair to acknowledge, I'm sorry. You said borrow money internally, which means that because they're not receiving, they're not submitting the billing and receiving the money in a timely manner, that they're using the money from within the public works budget and where is the money coming from? From the general fund. The general. It's coming directly from the general fund. Yes. And uh, each one of these, so we're paying the bills to transit. Yes. As they're being submitted, but yes. it's coming directly from the general fund. I, I'm, I'm wondering why the board hasn't been, uh, each time you're doing this, the board hasn't been told, I'm taking this money out of the general fund, ladies and gentlemen, you need to prove it. You need to show us that you agree. From a budget perspective, they have budget appropriations. Um, so they are fully within their authority to expend the monies because they have the budgeted appropriations. The issue is that the revenue claims are not happening in a timely manner. And it could be because the submission is out of compliance with TDA. It could be that um, last year um, what they had said is trying to get the federal claims, the forms or the system had changed and so they couldn't get them uh, done in a timely manner. So there could be a plethora of reasons why the claims are not either being prepared on a timely basis or are not or being rejected um, or not being approved. But um, they have the budget authority right now to operate, um, just like the general fund does. Uh, and there are times uh, in the year that the general fund is negative cash because we're waiting for a uh, tax revenue to post or waiting for you know whatever it is but we still have the budget authority we work uh, very closely with the administrative office to kind of say if we see a problem and I have um, reached out to administration and public works to just remind them hey don't forget you're you're getting a half a million dollars upside down. You know, we, we need to get this kind of wrapped up because it seems like it's deja vu happening again. Um, so if, if it comes to the point where we do not believe we're actually going to see that revenue come to fruition by June 30th, then I am here and, and I have been here and we have discussed this. But in the course of operations, if they, if I know that there is, um, and this is some of the benefit of having um, COG in our treasury as well, I know that there is local transportation funding there, but it has to be claimed. I know that there is STA funding, but it has to be claimed. Um, I know through research that there are federal funds, but they have to be claimed. So it's just a matter of trying to work with staff to say, you know, where are we in the process? Is this gonna happen by June 30th or if it isn't? And if it's not, then I'm absolutely coordinating with administration to say, uh, we're gonna have to go back to the board. So your, your explanation really broadened the whole concept of what's going on and I just want everybody to understand, I didn't ask you this question in advance. You didn't know no. I was gonna do this. No. But the point is, is that it helps to bring some better clarity to the overall fiscal situation that we're right in the middle of year over year. Yes, and so, um, and, and this kind of folds into why it's very important for us to have uh, uh, contingencies and to have reserves and to have um, monies that we can internally borrow against because we do have dry period um, funding issues across all funds. 
but in this particular case, it seems like it's a habitual issue and it doesn't clean itself up by June 30th, which is why we continue to come back to the board and ask for a loan. Do you recall that there was a supervisor sitting in my chair years ago that wanted to shut down transit completely? Okay. He's sitting over here. <laughs> he's always, I think he was oh, there, there, actually. Okay. <laughs> and he's from the city of Angels. So. Thank you, okay. Rebecca. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other public comment? Mr. Oh, me, Mr. Sorry, Chair. Ms. Callan. Ms. Callan, I have a question. Mr. Oliveira. Hi, thank you for coming over. Um, you mentioned loans made to transit by the county. Mm -hmm. If the decision is to form the new JPAs. Mm -hmm. How are we going to arrange payback to those loans to the county? Or is there a method for that? Uh, so historically- Is there a transfer of assets and liabilities? Well, the $15,000 is gonna need to be paid back to the general fund, period. And I, I'm not entirely sure where that money is coming from. So um, that, you know, that is a discussion that we'll have to kind of weed through all of this and figure out where does the $15,000 come from? Historically, if I go back as, as far as um, transit has been with the county and that we've had a financial system tracking transit activity, our revenues and our expenditures have always lined up. It's only been in the last five years that we've really had a problem. We've really had a struggle. And um, so it just keeps, it, it just gets worse and worse and worse. It's, you know, one year it's, you know, 100,000 and the next year it's 200,000 and then it's three, then it's five. So it just is progressively getting worse. But historically, prior to five years, the claims would be lined up with the um, expenditures. Everything would happen, sorry, in kind of in a timely manner. So there never was this issue. It's just, like I said, been in the last five years. So the comments earlier about, well, what happens if you're running in a deficit? Historically, transit hasn't ran in a deficit because the budget is based upon the, uh, the allocable LTF, local transportation funding dollars, the quarter cent, um, the quarter percent. It's on the STA. We know what those revenues are supposed to be. We know what the federal funding is going to be. And so you, they're putting a budget together based on known, um, known uh, revenues that are already out there. Now, if there is um, an issue with LTF, because LTF is, uh, is sales tax based, but I communicate that with, with the COG, and I let them know, hey, we're projecting lower than what we had originally issued as an estimate in February. So we're probably gonna have to um, you know, talk about that. There's either going to be you know, some change in the, in the budget scheme, or um, you know, you're gonna have to look at your reserve picture, or whatever it is. But it's not um, extremely volatile revenue, so they generally know what their they kind of are backing into what their budget can be based on pretty well-known and established revenue sources. So I don't generally see that, that there would be a deficit issue because um, luckily the bulk of the funding is not based on ridership. <laughs> We're not making money on uh, transit. So the bulk of the revenue is coming from the local transportation funding, the STA and the federal funds. So um, it's, it's just, it truly is an administrative issue. It's, it's truly just not lining up. One more quick question. Has all the loans been granted to transit from the county? Have they been paid back not, after receiving that funding? I'm still sitting with $15,000 owed to the general fund as of today. Okay, so there's a deficit of 13 grand. 15. 15 grand, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank so you. The, the deficit's half a million, but what's owed to the general fund right now is fifteen thousand. Thank you. Uh -huh. Anything else? Okay. Other public comments. Russ Thomas again. I, I apologize for frequently saying back in the old days when when I was sitting up there. But uh, how many of you ever rode the public transportation system? Okay. I back when we were meeting four times a month. I think you ought to reconsider that. 
But uh, I used to ride the bus from Copperopolis to to the county center here and attend the meetings and go home on the late bus, and I, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed the interaction with the students that were riding back home from football practice and stuff. Um, and I was also on the cog at that time, so I, I felt like I was putting some skin in the game. But we always had the idea that, that as long as we, you, you mentioned fare box revenue, 10% is what we were expected to, to put back in. And it was always gonna be 90% uh, funded by other sources. But um, I, I think that, that this particular proposal is um, presenting some pretty exciting opportunities. I, I think that, that with the uh, renewed enthusiasm by the City of Angels, uh, about uh, expanding their uh, presence in, in the county and their economic opportunities. I think that we have a, a, a kind of a, a fresh um, um, attitude with the health district here. I'm, I'm thinking that if I was still on the COG, I, I would be looking at, at a voucher system where the, the hospitals and the, and the uh, uh, health clinics around would, would be, uh, they would allocate a portion, portion of their budget that they could uh, present their um, uh, patients with a voucher system that would somehow pay back into this uh, uh, fare box revenue. But um, anyway, we we just need to, to recognize, uh, like Ms. Cowan said, that this the existing system is not working. Continuing with the existing system is not a good bet. So uh, I, I would encourage you to look for the opportunities presented in this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Ranky Angels Camp. I'm not gonna repeat a lot of what was already said, but I did wanna make one more reminder that I've sat in here this room before when transit's being discussed and every single time there's a problem with ridership and it's probably the nature of the beast and why do we spend the money that way? So I, I'm hearing some ideas that make sense possibly, but remember again, when you're, we're giving up everything to a, an agency and it looks like maybe they run mostly on grants from the federal and the, the state, um, no, federal funding? No. Okay, what is it? It's, it's, it's tax this, dollars for the dedicated state. for public transportation. Okay, and maybe that, so anyway, wherever it's coming from, I want you to remember it's us, the taxpayer. No matter where we put it, no matter where it goes, it comes from the taxpayer, and we do not like seeing our money wasted. So think very hard about that before we move forward. Thank you. Marty Crane, so I serve on the SysDAC since we started all this, and I was here when uh, a couple of supervisors thought that they were going to just shut it down because they wanted the money for their roads and bridges, and then when, when a presentation was made to show them what, it would, what kind of a system you'd have if it was only this, and what kind of system you'd have if it was only this funding, uh, they were shocked. And it was shocking to me to think that, find out that they didn't know how this was funded. So. Um, if any of you are not clear as the bell on how transit is funded, please, please look into that. Uh, but I wanted to say, yes, it's taxpayer money. We live in the country, so the benefits of living the country um, come with some challenges. And um, those of us that are here are here because we rode the bus or because we can still drive. But those of us who are not here, um, still need to be able to survive and having a transit system in the country while it is far more challenging is essential. You get rid of it and suddenly the people that are using it, to, uh, relying on it to get to work or go to school, they're out of the economic um, pool. So we have to have it and I, know, I, I do not feel that any money that is spent on transit is wasted. You know, it's my tax dollars too, and someday I may need the transit. And I agree with uh, Russ. I've ridden the bus, they're very comfortable. So anyway, lots of fun. Take care. Any other public comments? All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board and staff. Um, there was a couple questions asked. Phil, Amber, do you wanna answer? 
sure. I'm not sure if I remember all of them <laughs> um, well, um, or what clarifications maybe you guys are looking for from a couple of those comments. Well, I, I think the concept of, of some of the comments that were made about relinquishing our authority, um, I think the origin of, of COG itself and what the state mandates in order to receive those funds and receive transportation funds and all um, probably will answer some of those questions. And so if you want to elaborate on why COG exists and what it means to transportation funds um, to this county. Um, yeah, well, the COG is a regional transportation planning agency, which is um, through state legislation. And so you know, counties are required to have an RTPA in order to receive certain um, funding sources for transportation. And, you know, we have mandated planning um, processes and documents that we must do at the, at the COG level. Um, and, and to the point of, I think, having representatives from or elected officials on our board, we do have two county board of supervisors who are appointed to the COG board um, and then two city council members who are appointed to the COG board and those are elected officials. We do have three citizen members who are appointed um, by the elected officials. And the funds are not only that receive not only county funds, they are city funds also. So the form of the JPA was to receive all the funds that were available to us through the city and through the county to disperse those on projects in the county and the city. And, and so the same thing has to do with the trans, uh, public transportation dollars. They're received to the COG. COG is the ultimate um, entity that dispersed those funds. Years ago, we had it through the city. City was operating um, the transit system and they fell into some problems. So we brought it back to the COG and then COG gave it to the county. Um, and the county has had it ever since. But at, at, at originally, the COG did run um, the public transportation system um, until there was some laws and so forth going forward where we had to, to go out with it. Um, but there's a lot of things that have to do. You, you still have um, people that are elected in the, the, the COG. And what we're trying to do is the city has money that goes, that's meant for um, public transportation too, that they get from the state uh, through those tax dollars. And they haven't been part of um, any um, thing to do with how it's dispersed or even the routes. They had no input on that. We're bringing it back and forming this JPA to one, be a separate entity itself with elected officials on it and letting the city come in and have some say into how the routes are being run in the city, uh, what routes are being run in the city. They had some complaints about how it was moved around and wasn't primarily hitting um, the primary sites they felt needed to be uh, serviced. So um, that's part of the reason along with the reason of what Ms. Callan had said and talked about as the county has continuously, for the course of the last five years, uh, carried a loan uh, through our general funds um, through the course of the year and even past our um, uh, fiscal year, which makes it very difficult to close our books when you have outstanding um, loans out that aren't collected by the end of the fiscal year. Um, and it all has to do with the timing on submitting the applications for funding to the state in a timely manner in order to recover the funds from the state. You put together, like Amber had said and Phyllis said, you put together a budget knowing what funds are gonna be available, but it's not like <coughs> the state just sends you those funds automatically for your budget so you can expend them out of your general fund or whatever. You have to put periodically applications in showing what your vendor has spent and what your staff time has spent and alloc have those funds allocated at certain points in the year. If you miss those, then you can't go back after that deadline uh, to a certain period of time to go back and get those funds. And so that's what's happening. It's falling further and further and further behind. And right now the county has expended, like Ms. Callan has said, um, over a half a million dollars out of our general fund right now sitting there. And it probably won't get backfilled until those applications are paid by the state, which could be after our deadline of the fiscal year in, in July 1st. 
So I hope that explains some of the questions that were asked. No? <laughs> okay. It, uh, perhaps we could meet and spend a couple hours on it. So it's very, <laughs> it's very difficult. To, it, there's a lot of things that are involved. I'm trying to get a general overview of what, what's happening here. So. Yeah, and I think another element that I heard a little bit about is um, this idea of funding and, and really I think one of the goals of this JPA is to identify cost efficiencies. Um, and the more cost efficiencies you have, the more service you can provide for the same um, budget and amount. And you know, um, yes. Mr. Tofanelli is correct too, the COG is responsible for um, that funding. Um, we are a funding agent for the majority of the funding sources for transit. Um, so we do spend um, quite a bit of time on transit already at the COG level. Um, so we're really looking at this um, from you know, the regional perspective on how much um, staff time and resources are spent on a system of this size. So I think the, the um, purpose of the JPA is to consolidate staff resources um, and identify cost efficiencies. Yes, and, and as she mentioned, COG is, is responsible for all the transportation monies in the county. If, if you were here earlier, we had an item before us that had a call for, item, a call for projects from COG through our local public works. Um, that is um, uh, something that is provided from the county to the COG to accept to fund so we can look for funding for those projects. And COG is responsible to go out and try and find uh, most of the money for those projects. So, hope that explains some. So back at the board level, I'm looking for a motion or more comments? And we'll need a couple of motions on this. One of them is we are looking for a motion to authorize the relinquishment of transit program by Public Works Department to this new JPA. You want to take them as separate motions, Chair? Uh, we can either take them separate Don't or need. we can take them together. The other one would be and approve a joint powers agreement between the county, mm -hmm. the city of Angels Camp in COG. It needs to be one motion because it's one agenda item. Okay. So I would make the motion to relinquish the transit program operated by Public Works <coughs> and approve a joint powers agreement between the, city, the county, City of Angels Camp, and COG for transit services within the county. I would second that. I have a motion by Supervisor Mills and a second by Supervisor Clapp. Um, call for a vote, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. We'll take a five minute break for <coughs> them to pack up and move out. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we are back. Madam Clerk, item number 30. So before I read um, item number 30, I'd like to do the report out of the lunchtime closed session. So item four was conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, two <coughs> cases pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2. There was no reportable action taken. Thank you. Item 30 is from the administrative office and it's to receive a report from staff, Cal OES, and local organizations regarding the ongoing Butte fire recovery. Mr. Moss. Good afternoon, Brian Moss, administrative office. And uh, this is your uh, monthly report to the board um, status on Butte fire recovery and Butte fire updates. Um, as you know, we're, we're winding down with some programs like the uh, Insurance recovery for, for ash removal is, is getting pretty close, and, and at the same time, the insurance recovery for burn tree uh, disposal um, is, is still winding up, and I know that uh, Mr. Knight will be addressing that as well. So with that said, I'm going to turn this over to the department heads that are here to speak about this today. Thank you. Jeff Krovitz, Public Works. Um, Update I have for Butte Fire Recovery uh, will be the status of the debris removal trees program. As you all know, the majority of the trees were out by mid-January of 2017. We took out an additional 20 some odd punchless trees in December. Um, and we have been in the insurance recovery mode um, to avoid duplication of benefits for tree removal on private property as part of this program. 
Um, other items that are um, uh, of interest to the board, I would think, uh, I received this week concurrence from FEMA with the archeological treatment plan monitoring reporting that we did in summary of that first phase of tree removal and also the biological monitoring um, for the first phase. So um, there's a 30 day comment period for, um, for the county to get back to FEMA and then that report moves on to the next stage but the finding has been that the reporting provided by our contractor has met the requirements of the environmental document, the NEPA environmental document. Uh, the insurance recovery program for the uh, tree removal on private property is moving ahead. We have a total of 259 parcels, but many of those parcels are owned by the same owner. So we're dealing with less than 259 owners. Um, many of, the, uh, of those parcels, approximately 60%, we have already identified as having no insurance, and so we are ready to close um, those parcels out of the program. Um, uh, we have completed outreach to all other property owners within the program um, to uh, solicit and get copies of their insurance if we don't have it already. Um, and so we have, we have approximately 60 parcels closed. Um, the program is collected from four parcels to date. Um, we're expected to have um, the uh, debris removal costs coming from our, our, um, our manager, the field manager, field operations managers, this week, because we need those for insurance recovery. Um, and then the next step, it will be sending out the invoicing that says this is how much money the government has paid to um, abate your parcel of these trees. This is how much we see on your insurance. Um, unless you have other expenditures, provide them to us, or we're requesting uh, reimbursement of what uh, the owners have received from their insurance company. So that is the status of the uh, insurance program and the trees program. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it's interesting. We're, I'm seeing a lot of back and forth with our colleagues over on the coast, and uh, they are going through the exact same things, hitting every piece of furniture just like we did. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be nice if the state got this together because clearly we are not alone in this. Are we going to talk about the roads uh, next? Um, I know we, Quincy on board, are they starting to work? And I know we're waiting on our the, OES manager. Uh, the, the Quincy is not waiting for the OES manager. We are still getting through the contract and the task order negotiation. So um, the contractor, the contract is um, as was attached to the board item with mm -hmm. a few minor changes. Uh, that needs to be circulated. Their insurance needs to be verified, um, their EE&O as well as their um, drivers, liability insurance, and we have already received from Quincy uh, the, um, their estimated cost for the first task order. So um, we're expecting that, and we do not need to bring that back to board to get them to work. So as soon as they actually hit the ground running, I'll be sure to let you know. Thank you very much. Okay. Any other board questions? Thank you, Mr. Crowley. Sorry. Well, I, I need to be advised. We must be yeah. yeah. For Jeff? Uh, yeah, for, for Jeff. Jeff. Uh, Jeff. Jeff, come back up. You didn't have it on when I looked over. <laughs> Jeff, didn't have it on. It's all visual, isn't it? And the, the Jeff, the question is uh, regarding trees that are marked white CC that are still standing on property, uh, just for the public's awareness, what does that, what would that mean and what would they need to do? Um, the the trees that are still standing with white CC marks, either marks with a circle around the C or not, um, are all standing on BLM lands or on implied dedicated county right of way through BLM lands. And we are still working through a process um, to get those dealt with. Um, and uh, CAO and myself talked about that earlier this week. Um, and we think we have a good plan for moving that out, moving that forward finally. So the point is, is that they're not forgotten. They're not forgotten. Okay, that's the goal is, is that as people come up and ask questions, we'd like to know that we've got a good answer, or can turn them over for a good answer. The trees call to me at night when I sleep. Thank you. And uh, yeah, you could be assured, uh, Supervisor Mills, that uh, Director Kovitz gets a regular uh, call from me on the trees as well. And 
and including my going out with my GPS and marking that they are actually on BLM land. But we are actually going to deal with a few outs outliers tomorrow morning. And up in, uh, Thursday. Pardon me? Thursday or tomorrow? Pardon Thursday me? Thursday or tomorrow? It's tomorrow morning. Okay. At 8 a.m. See you there. So, Supervisor, you have his number on speed dial, is that it? Jeff Kovitz and I, have, we, I could talk about all kinds of circles and colors on trees. He, he has an iPhone, he says, call Krovitz. And any other supervisors? No lights. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mel Knight, uh, Butte Wildfire Community Liaison. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Butte structural debris and then just a little bit on the trees activity because of the nexus. Uh, I'm glad to announce today that we have completed all outreach activity. There will be no more letters going out on debris, on structural debris. Uh, we're now going to probably see maybe a, a couple of weeks of trickle in activity from both insurance companies and some of the insured. Uh, but by and large, uh, Tetra Tech and what time I'm spending will be devoted to a transition that includes now spending some time on trees, but being available during that transition to, uh, to deal with the stragglers. So again, we'd ended up with uh, about uh, 6.2 million to date. We expect to have about 6.5 by conclusion. Um, the goal wasn't to raise funds, but the goal was to see that the community got the assistance they needed in understanding the complex issue of what was their obligation under this duplication of benefit uh, program. And I will just repeat, because there continues to be a, a complicated issue, duplication of benefit means that you should have no out-of-pocket exposure to your dollars from receiving these services. Your liability and obligation is limited to those dollars that your insurance company provides you for work that was done by state and federal government uh, for which it's specifically earmarked for that work, the debris removal. And so uh, fortunately, again, our contractor, Tetra Tech, is, uh, has got a tremendous amount of background and experience at this, is able to sort through the insurance documents, able to sometimes uh, be able to sort this out for customers who are unable to uh, to do so, uh, at times educate some insurance adjusters. Uh, so it's been quite an interesting a, a path there. Uh, as mentioned, we're, we are working closely with our counterparts. Just yesterday, Lake County was in the office and they were learning from our experience. They are nowhere near as, as far along as, as we are. Uh, we have uh, been fortunate to be able to, to now have about 80% of these successfully resolved and it, it looks like approximately 20 and the numbers going down all the time that have ended up for one reason or another uh, are, are not totally resolved. And that's actually a, a lower ratio than most of the other areas at this point. Uh, and I think that we'll be soon turning over our report to the state and federal government that says, here is your $6.5 million. Here is the status of all of those properties. And we will uh, then be transitioning to uh, to the tree activity. Tree activity will be, now I'll transition to that a bit. Tree activity is much, much less complicated. As, as Mr. Krovitz mentioned, the numbers are much smaller. We have the same team of Tetra Tech folks working on this who already have dealt with many of these properties, many of these policies, many of these adjusters. So they are, uh, Jeremy, our, uh, our face of the program, is, has been able to get way ahead of this. We've saved a tremendous amount of time by having it done by the, the same individual. And I think that we're going to see a very successful approach. The other interesting twist to this is um, many of these trees, again, are limited to right-of-way trees. But insurance coverage typically covers tree and shrub removal. And it isn't specific to right-of-way trees. So we've had a number of folks who have said, by the way, yeah, I lost a lot of trees. I spent $31,000 of my own money on tree removal, and I got $10,000 from my insurance company. Well, that doesn't mean we get to $10,000. In fact, in all likelihood, it's our position that it's a duplication of benefit when you have dollars available that were not spent on, on your activity, but rather were spent on the state's activity. 
So, uh, so there will be some credit and potentially full credit, probably. We, we don't argue with the uh, public, so they will probably deal with both their attorney, uh, the insurance company, or, or whatever, to whatever conclusion they will come to, and we will simply pass that along. But I will expect a much reduced number for many of these because it seems to be somewhat logical and rational, although we haven't found a specific definition yet uh, that states how you would prorate this, for instance. If our 10 trees in the right-of-way were removed at our expense, but they removed 70 trees from their full property. Almost all these properties that have right-of-way trees also had non-right-of-way trees that required some attention. So it's going to be add, add a little bit of complexity in some ways, but it may also even just simplify it. So we'll be, again, finding our way on that. But that should end up uh, making this, uh, again, uh, something that we'll be able to deal with and deal with promptly. Any questions? Any board questions? Thank you very much, Mel. You turn your mic on. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Mel. As always, um, like you, I cannot wait for this piece of the puzzle to be over. Uh, insurance has just been extraordinarily difficult to deal with. What do we? What is our message to our residents who, you know, didn't get everything resolved? We're sending it down to Sacramento. Do you have any indication from Sacramento which black hole these documents are going to fall into? No, no, and I don't, I don't think there is an answer. Uh, for instance, I was talking to someone from Kern County last week that is doing the same thing. They attempted to move their money to Sacramento because they had completed what they were to do. And there was no one there to take it. So they haven't, uh, so actually we don't know who we're remitting this to? Yeah. Well, what will occur is is the auditor CAO, controller you're paying attention, will make right? arrangements with the either Cal OES or Cal Recycle uh, or the state treasurer or whomever it is designated to receive these dollars. We haven't been ready to transmit them. I'm assuming there will be some path but that is probably something that uh, Jeremy and I will not be involved in. And so uh, we, we could make these into Bitcoin. We could try to see if we can honor Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Well, certainly when we, do, when we get to that decision point, let's make sure we keep the board in the loop on yeah. oh, what we're going yeah. to do. If yeah. we can do that, that'd be great. Yeah. When you wrap this up and you've got that sum, let's talk about it as a yeah. board. We certainly will do that, although I expect that to occur before your next scheduled update at the board meeting, which would be a month from now. I think but I typically provide you with a weekly update as soon as we understand the transition. And, and I would imagine we will, we will find a way to get it on the agenda for six or seven million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Any other board questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Sonny. Um, Public comments. Oh, hold on, guys. We may have some public questions. Public comments on this item. Informational item, so there's no board action. All right, seeing none. Thank you, gentlemen. Moving on. Madam Clerk, item number 32. Item 32 is from the Planning Department. Um, to make a, find, a finding of public benefit and approve a fee waiver requested by the Calaveras County Arts Council for a special event permit for the third annual Ride and Walk for Art. Um, Mr. Mauer is not here. Um, CAO, you have anything on this? No? <laughs> okay, how about a motion? Do we have a motion? Mr. Chair, I so move we grant this request. Do I have a second? Second. Do we have any public comments on this side? I'm sorry, could I have the motion of the second again? We have a motion by Supervisor Oliveira, a second by Supervisor Garamendi. Thank you. And public comment on this item. This is a $100 fee being asked by the Arts Council to be waived for their event. I think it's a walk. Seeing none, bring it back to the board. Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, before we ask for a vote on this, I'd like to point out that the uh, rules policy of the county is requesting fee waivers such as this for the betterment of the community, which I think this falls in that category. Yes. Okay. That's all I have. That's all you have? Okay. Anything else? No, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
passes 5-0. Madam Clerk, item number 33, and I see Judy is here. Item. And she's got a, a bundle of paperwork. Item number 33 is from Human Resources to adopt a resolution approving modifications to the Calaveras County Public Safety Employees Association MOU for January 1, 2018 to June 30th, 2019. Good afternoon, Chair, Board of Supervisors, Judy Hawkins, Human Resources and Risk Management. I do have some items for the board today. We did have a last minute MOU changes, so I do have copies of the MOUs for the board, and then also I do have copies um, for our guests. Well, I'm happy to be before you today. Oh, sorry. I'm happy to be before you today bringing the uh, modifications to the CCP, CCPSEA MOU. We uh, had nine months of negotiations, um, and then we had a very successful end to our negotiations. We um, do have a 2% COLA that uh, will go into effect the first full pay period after board adoption. We also agreed upon positions that were uh, 15 to 20% below the R of, sorry, below um, equity um, from our um, comparison counties. And this also will help with some of, we keep popping up in the grand jury reports uh, for our correctional officers, and this will help um, in that arena. We also will be, um, with their additional 2% COLA, they will also be picking up additional PERS, and um, then we have another uh, equity increase for them in September. Their increases to the general fund is approximately 364.8 um, annually. And for fiscal year 17-18 budget, we'll see 91.5 percent, 91,500 um, increase. Any board questions? Now, the changes to the MOU are not any changes that would e affect any of the benefits that or wage increases that we have offered. The changes to the MOU, um, we substituted saying in the MOU we put that the increase would be effective, uh, for example, the first, of, first pay period in July. We substituted first pay period in July for July 7th. So we, we put the exact date by the request of the um, union. And so that's the only, the only change there. And then we also had some formatting issues that happened from going from a laptop to a desktop. And so we fixed those, those issues. Any board questions? No? Okay. We open it to public comment. Any public questions, comments? Um. I noticed there's an increase to the budget. Just have a question. Gentlemen, where does that money come from? It's not coming from our taxes anymore. I would like to mention that with the increase to the correctional pay, we are um, also hoping that the turnover to that position um, also decreases so that we will, uh, it'll be a swap out. It'll be a swap out, okay, thank you. Any other public comments? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Open for a motion. Mr. Go ahead. Mr. Chair, I move that we accept uh, the contracts as stated by Ms. Hawkins. I have a motion by Supervisor Oliveira. Second. 
Second by Supervisor Gerryman. Any other comments? No, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes 5-0. Thank you. And I also want to thank all the members of the CCPA bargaining team. This, this was a, a big effort on everybody's part. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'm, Madam Clerk, we have item number 34. <laughs> she got promoted. Almost close the airman, uh, uh, item 34 is from the Board of Supervisors to the appointment of applicants to serve on various committees, commissions, advisory boards, and county service areas. So we have, um, we have four appointments. Um, or vacancies that we have received applications for. The first is for the Area 12 Agency on Aging Advisory Council. It's one vacancy for a term ending 12-31-2021 for member one. It's uh, an application that's been received from Barbara Grogan. She is an incumbent. The next one is for the IHSS Advisory Committee. One vacancy for a term ending 12-31-2019 for a past or present consumer three, we received an application from Susanna Crow, who is an incumbent. Then, oh, and the next is um, from McCulmy Hill Cemetery District, one vacancy for an unexpired term ending 12-31-2020 for member two, and an application has been received from Paula Leitzel. Those are the only applications. Any board comments? Any board decisions on it? Well, Mr. Chair, I do have a, a question. On the IHSS Advisory Committee, understand the applicant's an incumbent. I would like to hear any public comment on that. I, I don't we'll know the individual. We'll open, yeah, we'll open it up for public comment. Okay. Yeah. Is that it? Supervisor Clapp, your light's on. No. No. All right, public comments. I'll open it for public comments. You can walk right along there. <laughs> I'm over the line. Uh oh, you're walking the line, yes. fine, you're walking the line. Um, is an incumbent somebody that's reappointed? Is that what an incumbent is? We've been using the term incumbent is to somebody whose term has recently expired and um, it, they are reapplying for the okay. position. Um, I would like you to observe our attendance record for the past two years. Um, this person was actually dismissed from our committee because of poor attendance and failure to communicate. So I don't think she's an incumbent. I think she's reapplying for a position that we asked the board last year to relieve her of so that we could find somebody that was willing to come to the meetings or communicate with us why they weren't attending the meetings. Um, I handed you my, um, uh, my, not my, our bylaws earlier today. And on page one, section one, part A, we have modified our qualifications for um, participation to include a segment of our uh, clients who have never been represented on this committee. Um, and you heard from Danielle Maxwell earlier today asking for permission to serve on this committee as representing her son. There are more people in the IHSS program who are under the age of 65 than we have seniors. And um, this segment has never been represented, children, young adults who are not able to uh, represent themselves. And so recently, some real issues have been raised by these people who have been attending our committee 
that we've never even considered before, children that have needs. So um, what we're asking at this point, I think, is for you to um, not appoint Ms. Crow, because we've had quite a history of trying to get her to be involved. And I question what her reasoning is for wanting to be on this committee, because it's been represented to us that she's not really interested. She just likes to have a place to come and bitch. And that we, we encourage that. That's what we want to hear, complaints. But we don't want somebody taking up space on our committee that doesn't attend the meetings and holds us up from sometimes not having a quorum or not being able to conduct business. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Marty Crane, I'm the secretary on the IHSS Advisory Committee. And I'd just like to say that it took us a year and a half, uh, close to uh, well over a year, to remove this person from the committee who wasn't attending. And when we were concerned about her, Bonnie even went to her home. And they said, well, just a minute. Whoever answered the door went in, came back out, and said she doesn't want to talk to you. So she wouldn't answer her mail. She wouldn't talk to us, anything. And um, uh, she, um, I just don't want to go there again because, uh, like Bonnie said, we're we're always looking for people to come and be productive members of the committee, and we understand that they can't always attend. But this was was wild. I mean, we started keeping track of the attendance specifically because of this one person. And so I um, highly, I, I find her reasons for wanting to be on this highly questionable. So thank you very much. I would also recommend that you not appoint me. Thank you. Any other public comments? George Fry, uh, I am now the past uh, chair and the new vice chair and Bonnie's the new chair. Um, it was amazing what we had to go through for a year and a half to get this lady to respond to us. She wouldn't even accept um, a letter that was registered mail with return receipt. And Diane knows what we've been through. And uh, to me, she's no incumbent. We finally uh, got her removed from the committee. We got somebody that's really interested and involved in our committee. So I do not recommend that she be appointed. Thank you. Bill Wilson, District 1. Gentlemen, you just heard three people that served on that committee that said this person is, number one, not an incumbent in their opinion because they have not showed up. It'd be like one or two of you not showing up for board meetings for a year and a half while your four-year term is in process. Hmm. I don't think that person needs to be on that board. I think we need a person that shows up, that participates in that board, that participates in the community, not just shows up, as somebody said, to bitch. Any other public comments? Uh, Marty, one time. You get one. You had one time. That's it. One time. One time. Any other public comments? Seeing none, we bring it back to the board. Would you like me to address any of the concerns that were brought up? Yes. Okay. Um, so yes, the IHSS advisory committee um, did um, provide you with a tracking of their um, attendees membership. Um, our attendance. Um, they did um, experience a period of time last year with um, Ms. Crow was unable to attend meetings. They did request, they sent me a letter to give to you that said that they wanted her removed. However, the committee had taken no formal action in a meeting that had an agendized item to discuss removing, requesting that she be removed. And um, so they had to then agendize the item. They had to have a meeting that had a quorum 
and then they had to provide the documentation that she, that the committee had uh, voiced the concern that they wanted her to be removed. At the time that we received all of that, it was time for the annual vacancy publication. So her term was expiring. So our office decided that it was in the best interest of the applicant and the Board of Supervisors and the group to see if the term expired, if the term expired and she did not reapply, it was already um, advertised for. Um, on her application, um, Ms. Crow has expressed that she had some grave health concerns along with the grave health concerns of her husband, uh, which have now been rectified. I know that in the past, um, in many various kinds of discussions with the group, um, they have said that they have a very fragile um, population on their committee. And so um, it sounds uh, from the documentation we've received that the health situation has been rectified and that this person is um, anxious to come back and to serve on the committee. Um, as for the bylaws, the bylaws may be adopted by the group, but then they have to come to the Board of Supervisors to be approved, and that hasn't happened. I haven't been provided with them. So until the Board of Supervisors approves the bylaws, they are not in effect. So we are functioning under whatever was in place prior to this revision. Thank you. Any other board comments? Yeah, I would have one. Um, I understand what the IHS is going through because my CSA has the same problems at times. We get a, a person that no longer attends the meetings, they don't want to be on, and it's quite difficult to get that person replaced. And I know we're making some new rules and stuff on procedures of our uh, committees. And I'd like that to be addressed as we do that new, uh, as we go through the new uh, regulations that we're removing someone from a, a thing, because it should be like Jack's on the committee, he should be able to come to us and say, I want this person replaced or something. It should be a lot more streamlined than what it is now. Thank you. Supervisor Oliveira, your light's on. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I noticed that there is one other person According to this document provided to the board, uh, that has a track record of not showing our unexcused absences. Uh, that that person listed on the bottom of this document. Is there any procedures to have that person removed from the board? Also, I would ask that question. Which not person? of the public, please, not of the public. Which person is that? Uh, that? That would be the last one, Gail Williams. She was only appointed at the last Board of Supervisors meeting. She was oh, not okay. a member. Um, right. And the list, uh, this list, I don't think um, pertains to her, although okay. her name is there. So that, that, that's an error as far as the information provided. Is that correct? She, is, she was not a member last okay. year on the committee. Um, and just to, just to note, um, of the um, total positions that are, are um, on the IHSS advisory committee, they have two vacancies. They have more than enough members to have quorums and to have meetings okay. at Thank this you. time. And I noticed that in the board packet, maybe I just didn't receive it, the applicant's application is not listed electronically. Is that correct? As, you, as normal? Um, the application should be part of the board's packet. Um, people that are applying for positions on advisory committees, their personal information is not public until after they are appointed. And so they, their applications are not viewable by the public as part of the public package. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, Supervisor Garamendi, are you not the board representative on this I am. committee? I'd like, to hear, I'd like to hear from you. One meeting in, so I can't say I'm an expert on this stuff at all, but I'm trying to learn as I've let the committee know. Um, you know, I think certainly um, from my understanding, I would seek uh, Supervisor Clapson put on this as he served on there as well. It is a fragile committee. 
they're trying to move things together. Um, I think it seems to be working from my one meeting. And um, I would hate to, I've got three, I got the, the president, the past president, and the secretary all advising not to put this person on there. And so I would have to rely on, on their years of experience serving on this board over my one meeting. Okay, that's fair enough. Supervisor Blaff, you're shaking your head yes. So you, have, you want to turn your microphone on? I would agree with Jack okay. on that. So um, since we brought it back to the board, we have, we can kick the IHSS out and call for a motion for the remaining two and deal with it on its own. So I'll call for a motion for Area 12, applicant and McCollumie Hill Cemetery. So moved. Motion by Supervisor Mills. Second. Second by Supervisor Garamendi. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes by zero. Now IHSS, do I hear a motion for acceptance? or no motion uh, Mr. do we have a motion to Mr. Chairman you're, you're seeking a motion for acceptance I'm su seeking a motion for anything at this point I'm just asking for a motion oh so if you want to make a motion to deny or accept that's up to you whether we get a second or a vote for it um, I'm, I'm confused why don't I do this I'll make a motion to accept her on the IHSS. Let's see if we get a second and we can go from there. Is there a second to that motion? Seeing none, it dies for no second. Now I'll look for a motion to deny this application. So moved, Mr. Chair. We have a motion to deny this application. Do I have a second? I don't have a second. It dies and we yes. won't appoint her. Okay. Moving on. Madam um, Clerk, item number 35. Could I request that we just take a five minute break to allow staff to get in place for the next item? Yes. <laughs> Item 35 is from the Elections Department to certify EIR, adopt CEQA findings of fact, and MMRP. Adopt a resolution calling a special election or calling a special advisory vote election and consolidating it with the June 5, 2018 statewide primary election for the purpose of enabling the people of Calaveras County to vote to approve or reject an ordinance rescinding chapter 17.95 and replacing it with a new chapter 17.95 banning or regulating cannabis cultivation and related cannabis activities. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, seeing uh, the reading by Madam Clerk indicates several different segments of this particular item. Is it possible we could bifurcate and take these uh, as far as the explanation one at a time or look at them as a whole? What would be your recommendation, Mr. Chair? Well, at, at the moment, why don't we allow uh, Mr. Maurer and Mrs. Moss to present, give their presentation to us first, and then we can decide how we want to handle them. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. What is your point of order, sir? Rule 30 of the Board Procedures and Handbooks Conflict of Interest states any member with a disqualifying conflict of interest must, in compliance with the Public uh, Political Reform Act, A, publicly state the nature of the conflict in sufficient detail to be understood by the public, B, recuse himself, herself from discussing and voting on an item, and C, leave the room until after the discussion, vote, and other disposition of the matter is concluded unless the matter has been placed on a consent calendar, uh, it goes on. Specifically, there are two supervisors that have conflicts of interest with regard to this issue. 
Supervisor Clapp has an outstanding FBPC violation that is being investigated regarding the banning of cannabis. This will affect his material financial interest. Furthermore, Supervisor Mills also, as a result of gifts that he has received from the Communications Institute and other volunteers from political organizations, has received a gift that is in excess of $470, which means that he too has a disqualifying conflict of interest. Here's a complaint that details all of this. It's been sent to the board clerk. A copy should be forwarded on to all of you. And I can, I only have one copy. So my point of order is that two supervisors sitting on this board should not be able to sit and hear this issue because of their conflicts of interest. Okay, and I will refer to county council. I'm just now being handed a copy of this complaint, so either we can take a break, allow me an opportunity to review this, okay. um, and I have an opportunity to speak with the two supervisors. Why don't we take a, how long do you Alternatively, need? we can at least have staff do a presentation, um, and I can read it while there is staff presentation, but... Um, it is certainly up to the board chair. Okay, well, why don't, why don't we have them pr start presenting their um, presentation, and you can read it, and when we get to a point where you um, read it, then we can stop, and you can maybe take 10 minutes and talk to those two, okay? Mr. Chair, um, yes. that was presented as a public document. Is it the opportunity for each supervisor to get a copy of that? I mean, it's, what's our procedure? Normally, anything that is handed out during um, a meeting or presented to the clerk uh, to be submitted into the record is kept by the clerk, scanned, and available upon request after the meeting, like the next day or two. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. I, just as a preliminary matter, we'll, and we, I, we will start with Ms. Turner I'm from the elections official because it's a, it is an elections item. There are three actions that the board will need to take if it wants to put one or more of the ballot uh, measures in front of the voters. Um, because it's a county initiated ballot measure, it would have to, before it made a decision to put anything on the ballot, it would need to, um, certify the EIR, it would be the same EIR used for the permanent ordinance, um, certify it for this particular project. Um, and then as a second action, it would need to adopt um, CEQA findings of fact and the mitigation, and if a regulatory measure is among those being sent forward, also a mitigation monitoring reporting program. And then third, only after the CEQA um, <coughs> actions have been taken at that point, it can choose to adopt a resolution that actually calls a special election because the calling of the election is the project under CEQA and CEQA has to come first. So those are the, act the three actions that need to be taken. But for just the ease of presentation, we can start with the elections official and then Mr. Maurer will talk about the ordinances presented and some modifications that were made since you last saw both of them. <coughs> Rebecca Turner, um, Registrar of Voters. So what I'm bringing today based off of the discussion on January 10th when staff was asked to prepare items for the ballot is um, four resolutions. So you'll find in your packet that you had four different resolutions. One um, was calling an election for um, repealing existing chapter 1795 and um, <clears throat> bringing forward a new 1795 that's prohibiting recreation and medical cannabis. And the other is also repealing 17.95 and bringing forward a um, new 17.95 for cannabis use. So I'll definitely let Peter explain <laughs> uh, <laughs> the ordinances and what they contains. Um, so all I wanna explain is the four options. Um, one resolution is bringing both measures to the ballot. So if we had two measures on the same ballot, the measure that received the highest number of votes in favor would be the one that went into effect. Um, or you have the option of bringing just one of the measures to the ballot. Um, so there's a resolution there for both of those. 
Or the third option I brought is if the board is looking at this specifically um, to get public opinion, um, I put both measures in as an advisory election in the final resolution where you could get the public's opinion on whether or not they approve of the measure. So an advisory election is um, just that. It's asking for an advisory vote only. Nothing would go into effect um, based off of that vote, and it would bring it back to the board to decide what to do. And on that note, if the board chose to go the advisory route, that would not be a project under CEQA. No, mm -hmm. nothing would need to be adopted because no action would actually be taken until it came back and the board made a decision whether to act based on the ballot result. Um, I really don't have anything else to add, so I'm going to send it to Peter, and if you have any questions, let me know. Mr. Maurer. Peter Maurer, Planning Director. Um, so before you are two versions of an ordinance that could go on the ballot if you so choose. And the direction that we received on January 10th was to bring the, as we understood it, to bring the Planning Commission's recommended version, which was uh, after we'd heard from this board, we referred it back to the commission, they had made some modifications to a prior version of it, and then uh, in December, we brought um, two separate versions uh, back to you. Um, so the first option or an option is the ban, and I just want to briefly go over the changes to that that were made from the ban ordinance that was adopted on January 10th. And I'm referring to uh, attachment F, which is the underlying strikeout version of the ordinance. It begins on page 995, at least the numbering in my packet. I don't know if the numbering is the same in yours, because sometimes you have other materials that we don't get. But in the public packet, it's on page 995. And um, there are some minor changes where we've you know, changed from things like the Board of Supervisors to the people. And along those lines, there was one that was missed, and that is under um, section three, the findings. That should also read the people rather than uh, the Board of Supervisors and grammatically changing the does to do and that kind of uh, change. There are only really one, is it, oh, there is only one substantial Mr. Chair, change. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry for interrupting. We're still trying to find not, okay. page 995 here. Right. <laughs> 900 pages. Yeah, only 1,600. Okay. Um, it says in ordinance, the, the heading is an ordinance of the Board of Supervisors. The Board of Supervisors is crossed out and it says people. Yes. And it's underlined. It's on page 995. But there's another, what we're trying to point out is that there's one that we missed. Mm -hmm. And so that's, um, I don't know if you have it this way, but it's page 14 of our um, markup version and it's section three which comes after the main body of the ordinance mm -hmm. section two is severability section three is findings point of order what is your point of order sir my point of order is, is that i want silence behind me so i can hear everything that's going on thank you thank you <laughs> okay so under section three findings it, it inadvertently reads, the Board of Supervisors of the County of Calaveras finds, which is read, the people of the County of Calaveras find. And, and declare. Find and declare, right. And that's on page 1008 of the board packet. So the next uh, change uh, is a provision that was added. It's 1795030H on page 1000, page six of the ordinance. Uh, and it adds a, a, a provision that the county may modify the ordinance in non-substantive ways. So if there's clarification needed, changes to state law, as long as it doesn't change the underlying provisions of the code, if we find that there's some clerical error or something that just needs to be fixed, it does allow the board to fix those without having to go back to the voters. So that section has been added. Um, and there, um, there was a change in 040C10, it's on page 1003, and uh, that changes the restriction on uh, cultivation where a daycare center is located. It used to read um, where there is a residence and now reads on any parcel where a daycare center is. So it's clear that where there's a daycare center, cultivation can't occur. Um, and then there were changes to the findings in section three 
Uh, it updated uh, findings C and D to reflect the current status of, um, oh, I'm sorry, page, uh, I didn't write that down. Um, page 15, uh, 1009. Uh, and it just updates the current status of federal enforcement provisions in the uh, Rohrabacher Farr Amendment and the um, uh, findings under um, the Cole Memo, the, those, those um, statements. So those are the only changes that we've made to the ban uh, version of an ordinance that might go to the, to the ballot. Um, just to sort of bring it up and make sure that it's consistent with all the things that we, that we believe was intended by the board in that and, and to bring it up to date. Um, the, there are a few more changes to the Planning Commission's recommendation. This is uh, attachment H. It begins on page 1070. I'll give you a moment to scroll to that page. It has similar changes of the people from the Board of Supervisors. There's a few other just sort of minor um, clerical corrections, things like it sort of said chapter rather than section. Uh, but the substantive changes are uh, beginning on page 1076, uh, definition uh, BBB shop. The term shop was deleted from the terminology used. What section? Uh, 1795 020. The definitions. Okay, thanks. Uh, page seven of the ordinance itself. Uh, so the term shop was not used in the ordinance, so that definition was deleted. Uh, also, where the word shop was used in the Planning Commission's version, we used the term residential accessory structure instead. Non-residential non accessory structure. So that uh, that was a term that was already defined in our county code, so we didn't need to create a new term so that would be if someone had a an outbuilding or a, a shed on their property, that that fall under that, that definition. Uh, on page 1078, um, we added the same uh, non-substantive change requirements. This would be 030H. Uh, so the same provisions that allow some minor modifications to the ordinance without having to go back to the voters would be permitted. On page 1086, Section 060B4. And this is just an update to the requirements of the state for a notice of applicability. We referred to an old provision of state, uh, state codes for, um, or, or the general order. And so this just sort of uh, more generalizes the reference to the general order because that one has since expired and we now have a new general order that we're operating under for the notice of applicability for the water board. <coughs> and um, so we just have changed it to be more uh, general as, as the most, whatever the most recent version is. This is four, you said four, that's four. on page 1085. Yes, oh, 1085. Thank you. Sorry. The next um, substantive change is um, on page 1087, and it pulls, rolls over into 1088. Uh, the provisions for um, uh, review for proposed cultivation sites next to an existing residential property. And initially, the Planning Commission had wanted to go to the Planning Commission, so any registration, um, the, the, the language that went to the board and the Planning Commission sort of agreed with this in, in concept was that instead of all of them going to the Planning Commission, there would be a provision for notification to the Planning Director or by the Planning Director to all the surrounding property owners within 500 or 300 feet of the property uh, that they would be notified of a pending application <coughs> they would have the ability to raise concerns to me. I could then uh, impose conditions or whoever the planning director could impose uh, conditions on that, which would be appealable to the, to the planning commission. So it, it sort of 
eliminates the need to take every one of them to the Planning Commission and, and bog down their um, uh, agendas with a lot of cannabis uh, cultivation applications that may or may not be controversial. There's obviously going to be some, and that would provide the opportunity for uh, the planning director to make uh, those decisions with an appeal, a uh, course of appeal action to the, the, to the commission. So section F uh, and G um, and H were modified to uh, reflect that uh, course of action. Um, and that was also contained in the version that went to the board, um, uh, the, the uh, regulatory version. Um, on page 1090, there were some changes to the um, well water testing and reporting mechanisms, uh, working with the environmental, environmental Management Agency uh, director, the mitigation measure that was recommended in the EIR, he found to be somewhat unworkable, and that this, the provisions that we changed and modified again um, actually provide for sort of upfront testing of water rather than a monitoring after the fact. And so we felt that this was more effective mitigation and it was something that the Environmental Management Agency director felt was a better means of testing water and its potential impact on surrounding properties. The next change is on 1092. And this was to simply adding additional lighting that was part of the mitigation measure from the EIR that was left out of the original language. So it just clarifies um, about the amount of light, lighting and, and the screening and, and shielding of that lighting that's necessary. On page 1097, page 28 of the, um, the ordinance. Peter? Yes. Page 1093, you struck line 11 completely. Oh, that was just a duplication. That was a duplication. Yes. So yeah, there's a few, of, I'm not going over every single change. Those are all in, you know, so I'm going over the ones that really have some uh, substantial uh, changes. Um, I think we're going no. over the changes no. from the regular from the mm -hmm. version that you saw last. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going over now. Right, right. Um, so let's see. So the next substantive change was um, on page 1097, 070 D7 uh, added a uh, statement that requires. Um, documentation that any excess canopy that's required to be destroyed actually be presented to the county to document that it was destroyed. Um, and that was something that the sheriff had requested. Um, we also uh, revised the language on 1102, this is 070E10. Um, at the request of the sheriff, uh, modify the language regarding uh, armed security. It basically prohibits armed security um, outdoors on a commercial cultivation. 070E11 and F9, and this is on pages 1103 through, I'm gonna check this right. 1103 through 1106. Um, there was a mitigation measure that was inadvertently left out of um, the Planning Commission's recommendation and this had to do with uh, offsetting impacts for greenhouse gases. And it's, um, I'm sorry, E15 and uh, F9 of subsection 070. We also then um, made some modifications on page 1108 uh, to um, the renewal provisions, and this just was intended to clarify the process for, for renewal. Um, and then finally, the last changes were made to the, uh, the findings, uh, sections C and D, similar to the ban that updated the federal requirements. 
So those are the changes. The intent was that we only made those that were based on the need for clarification or something that was left out that was intended to be there initially that we just missed with the Planning Commission uh, and did not substantially change the process that was um, recommended by, by the Planning Commission to you. Do you have any questions about that? Any questions? Supervisor Garamendi, your light's on. Supervisor Oliveira, your light's on. No comments, sorry. No comments? Do we have any <coughs> thing to talk about? Do you want to discuss anything, any of these items, before we go to public comment? Mr. Chair, I, I would like to have that break for county council to look over the documents submitted and maybe advise the board. <coughs> I would just clarify, uh, Mr. Wickey, um, I want to, where is he? He's, I think he's sitting outside. There he is. Um, I wanted to clarify, it appears that this is a complaint um, with the FPPC. Has this been filed and has it been served on Supervisor Mills? It is getting filed later tonight. Um, I need to add the uh, footnotes. Okay. That, that's if I could take a quick yeah, break and I will right. um, yeah. and just for the record just to clarify my office does not provide legal advice to individual supervisors as it relate, relates to FPPC complaints um, however if it has an impact on the body as a whole we certainly um, consider those things but we do not provide legal advice to individual supervisors um, I will be uh, discussing this with Supervisor Mills since he has not been served. We'll take a break. I don't know how long it's going to take. It can take anywhere from 10 minutes to 15 minutes. I, I'm guessing. <laughs> 